Well, thanks everybody for coming today. I'd like to announce, uh, unfortunately, Hassan Hassan will not be here today. Um, so far, the ceasefire in Syria is holding up. He's at the State Department. Uh, he works the Syria portfolio. And uh, all reports say the ceasefire is holding up at least in the last two to four hours. And hopefully, he'll be able to make some difference there. I think he'd actually be more effective here, to be honest with you, get away from the State Department bureaucracy. But we'll see what he can do there. Um, so today, uh, we are going to talk about whether or not the strategy to defeat ISIS is working and whether this current strategy will push ISIS into an al-Qaeda model to actually expand. And uh, if we look at ISIS in 2014, if you can go to, go to that map where ISIS is operating. Okay, here we see where ISIS is currently operating. In 2014, ISIS was operating, or ISIS was established in Syria and Iraq. Um, as ISIS began to lose territory, it started standing up affiliations. And now we're looking at 2016, where ISIS is now. So let's go back to 2014 for a second, and we'll talk about um, the first instance where we noticed that any time ISIS faced a formidable proxy force on the ground supported by U.S. airstrikes, it lost territory. First instance of that was the Mosul Dam. ISIS lost the Mosul Dam and went to a, uh, a strategy to compensate by conducting high-profile executions. And we started seeing our journalists uh, executed. After the loss of territory in Kobani, there were a series of high-profile executions and also the standing up of affiliations across the Middle East and North Africa. So as ISIS continues to lose territory in Iraq and Syria, we're seeing that it still has plenty of places where it can actually plan attacks, recruit and train ISIS fighters to carry out attacks in other areas. So as we go into this political campaign season and we start to tout the successes of the administration's um, ISIS strategy, the administration had three focus areas, Raqqa, raids, and Ramadi. Where Ramadi was cleared, so to speak, of ISIS. Uh, the raids have actually um, taken out several key ISIS leaders. And we'll talk about that again because there's, there's some historical significance there. And also, um, we know that the Raqqa offensive has not started yet. And the U.S. position is actually tilted more closely towards the Russian position and the Iranian position when it comes to Syria. So today, we hope to, we hope to talk about uh, this issue and actually provide solutions, uh, solution-based recommendations and strategies as we look to uh, what ISIS is actually doing as it loses territory in other areas to compensate and actually morph towards more of an al-Qaeda model. And I have the, the, the honor of having uh, two esteemed colleagues here today, uh, to my right, uh, Nita Bacos, uh, senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. But more importantly, she worked on the Iraq team at the CIA in 2002. So before we went into Iraq, you were already developing a lot of these targets for, for some of the people that we would see eventually join al-Qaeda, such as former, former Ba'athist special operators and former Ba'athist intelligence officers. Um, she also stayed on that team to 2011 and was instrumental in developing the intelligence that led to the targeting of Zarqawi, the father of ISIS, the first iteration of, of the Islamic State in Iraq in 2006. And we'll talk about that as well. And then to my left, Amanda Kaldick. Uh, she spent a lot of time in the Middle East doing this on her own dime. She's a, a former, formerly with the Carnegie Institute. She was on the transition team in Libya, basically after Gaddafi's government fell. She was there to oversee the transition uh, post-Gaddafi operations and has some good experience there. She was also the first analyst that was talking about ISIS expanding in Libya and Algeria and other places. As everyone was looking to Iraq and Syria, she was already beating the table talking about ISIS being in Libya. Uh, she studied Arabic in Cairo. She studied Arabic in Beirut, Lebanon. And she's corrected me several times already in the back room on how to pronounce things. I told her not to do it on stage, but we should be OK. <laughs> so we, we're going to talk for about 45 minutes, and we're going to open it up to questions, because we think the questions will drive the discussion here. And uh, I'm going to play the role of both moderator and a panelist with the absence of Hassan Hassan, but I know we're going to have a lot of information here. So the first thing I'd like to do is throw it to you and 
have you talk a little bit about your experience, of course, about developing these targets. But, but the one thing I'm really interested in, in is Zarqawi was killed in 2006 and what it did to al-Qaeda and what it didn't do. But thanks for being here today. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, I'll back up a little bit and then go to that question. So in 2002, when we were developing intelligence on Iraq, there was not a al-Qaeda in Iraq yet. Zarqawi's organization had left Afghanistan, spent a little, he was just a network at the time, spent a little time in Iran, and then eventually um, ended up in northern Iraq, co-located with um, Ansar al-Islam. And he, he really was focused on Jordan at the time. So it eventually progressed into um, a little interest in the United States after the invasion. And that little interest turned into his main target and his main strategy. So as, as time progressed and he built up his network and he ended up deciding that co-opting the brand of Al-Qaeda was going to be useful for him in 2004, he joined Al-Qaeda. I swear by Allah to Osama bin Laden. And for me, when you look at taking out leaders in any organization, it has, depending on who it is, it does have operational impact. But it's sometimes intermittent and, and temporary. Taking out Zerkawi was useful because at the time he was the strategist for the organization, they were following a large part of what he decided that he was going to do, which bin Laden was arguing against, um, just blatantly killing all civilians. But as time progressed, obviously, we've now seen that the organization evolved beyond Zerkawi's death into something a little bit different, but it's still the same playbook that Zarqawi was using to build his organization, because he's always looking at building a caliphate and, and capturing territory. What's, what's interesting about that is um, we have some high-profile pro deaths in, in ISIS, such as al-Adnani. Al-Adnani was back with Zarqawi back in 2006, one of Zarqawi's original, original members, and an instrumental in the organization, and also basically given, given uh, de facto control over the Syrian ISIS operation. With his death, uh, and basically going back to Zarqawi's death in 2006, what kind of impact did Zarqawi's death have on al-Qaeda at the time? It didn't dismantle, it didn't go away. And what kind of impact is al-Adnani's uh, death having on ISIS now? So Zarqawi's network, a lot like al-Qaeda, um, they really did find value in keeping some of the members who had initially been there around, even after it had metamorphosed into ISIS. So when I'm looking at all of these, these organizations now as just a private citizen, I keep looking for some of those original members because I'm convinced the ones who haven't been killed are largely still there. And when you look at the impact of, of Zarqawi's death on al-Qaeda in Iraq, they were kind of the first franchise for al-Qaeda besides AQAP. They, they really took this to a whole different level as far as autonomy. Zarqawi was arguing with Zawahiri and bin Laden against the al-Qaeda strategy and decided to deplore his own. So while it did have an impact on al-Qaeda in Iraq, al-Qaeda in Iraq was already a different animal than typical franchises of al-Qaeda, and certainly from al-Qaeda Central. They had the luxury of being able to take the lessons learned from al-Qaeda, put it into ISIS, and actually explode into this organization, a formidable, formidable terrorist army. Uh, and that's why it would have been great to have Hassan Hassan here to be able to talk about some of those things. But um, you, you have to look at this organization, and you have to, as an intelligence officer, I'm a former intelligence officer, as are you, and the things we're asked to, to do is, Look at an organization, tell us, tell us its weaknesses, tell us who the key leaders are and how to destroy this. I mean, when you contrast that with an analyst and, and some of the other intelligence agencies, they tend to fall back on this uh, portfolio-type view of their, their target. Uh, tell us about the personalities, but they don't really go into who you actually target to, to disrupt an organization or how, how resilient that organization is to replace people. And that's what we saw with Al-Qaeda in Iraq, their ability to replace Quickly. Well, I would I would say the intelligence organization I work for did approach it a little differently right. than that. It wasn't specifically looking at targets and dismantling person by person. Because we did eventually, we understood even in the beginning that the whack-a-mole piece of this was not going to work. Right. Um, I mean, that's how they targeted 
uh, Al Qaeda. Also, you have to you have to approach the group in a in a broader strategy in a way that it actually disrupts and dismantles. So, if you were to advise the administration on current ISIS strategy or the next administrations, what would you see would be the most? What would you say would be the most important thing? Or, or three or four tenets that they should focus on to, to disrupt this organization? Well, and I don't see ISIS as strictly the only threat that we have when it right, comes right. to terrorism. I think al-Qaeda is still there as a long-term threat for the United States and any Western government. Um, but for ISIS in particular, taking the oxygen out of the territory that they control. They've already metamorphosed into another type of organization where they're inciting and directing attacks outside of the territory they control. So. Um, in, in addition to any kind, kind of military intelligence effort, effort, there has to be some strategies against countering violent extre extremism. And I say that cautiously because I don't believe there's one root cause of that. Um, but there is a necessary uh, approach that I think the, the government needs to take, and that includes diplomacy and a variety of other things. Right. So the current strategy, and I'll we'll get to you on this part here, the current strategy seems to be um, – Depopulate a Sunni area that ISIS controls. Uh, disperse ISIS. Replace the ISIS flag with an Iraqi flag, a Syrian flag, a Libyan flag, whatever flag that may be. But as you look at the loss of territory, um, I argue that it's not sustainable. And you made this point the other, the other night on BBC International when the CERT uh, proxy forces in Libya were able to work with American Air Force and, and take territory away from ISIS and CERT. And you and you made you made a key point that just because of, there's a loss of territory mm -hmm. doesn't mean that the organization goes away. Right, um, that's definitely true. Um, so uh, just to give you a little bit of background on Libya and the recent uh, events that have been been going on there. So I'm sure, as you know, the U.S. has been um, launching airstrikes for the past month, month and a half now, um, in the territory of CERT along the northern coast of Libya. Um, and they're doing it in support of uh, militias that are on the ground from the nearby town of Misrata. Uh, the Misrata militias are the most well-armed, trained, or this is what is argued, is the most well-trained and well-armed in Libya. Um, on the eastern side, there, some, some people might disagree with that. But, um, so they've been fighting CERT in, in, uh, I'm sorry, ISIS and CERT and have been doing quite well. Um, the problem is that uh, their tactics are pretty nasty, and Misrata, despite having U.S. air support, is having difficulty in taking the town. So uh, they've been able to get back, like most of the town, but there are estimated 150 to 200 fighters left. Um, so they've been kicked out, but the rumor is, or as some people who I know who uh, are on the ground there tell me they have moved south. So in April, before this all began, um, CERT was able to take this checkpoint called Abu Ghraim from ISIS. It's just south of CERT. I'm sorry, ISIS fought back Misrat, the Misrat militias, and they were able to gain control of that checkpoint for three weeks. Um, some suggest that during that period, the commanders in uh, CERT, the ISIS commanders in CERT, were able to escape through the south because they knew that the offensive was coming. Because their Hiftar's forces in the east and Misrata's forces more westward had been positioning themselves for months to take CERT. So that's a strategy. And now, so just as a little anecdote, in the past two weeks, you know, we're saying. Misratans are finishing up the job and, and kicking ISIS out of CERT, but um, there have been roadside attacks from, on the road from Misrata to CERT and that have attacked Misratan forces. So this is a sort of pattern I think that will be seen. Uh, ISIS has been kicked out of Derna by local forces, now um, CERT by local forces, but it, it, it's going to take on a new form as far as I can see. It's going to be something more like you're going to see more roadside attacks on Militias. There's just going to be massive. They're going to be more targeted uh, points of disruption than there are, you know, an effort to take territory because they don't have that capacity now. They might later, but no, no. Let me ask you about the population. So, in Iraq and Syria, the forces being used to clear territory from ISIS 
are not necessarily forces that can actually stay and hold that territory, meaning they're rejected by the local population as, as from the wrong sect, from the wrong militia, from the wrong tribe. Uh, is that also the case in Libya? Yes. Libya is Sunni. I mean, m the entire population is Sunni. There's a minority uh, Amazigh population, um, but they're all Muslim. Um, the, the bigger rifts in Libya are tribal. So um, particularly, and this is how uh, ISIS, I'm going to say IS because they're not in the Levant or Iraq, so I'm just going to say IS from, from here on out. But so IS in, um, in Libya has been able to exploit the rifts that Gaddafi put in place when he was in power. So um, there are Gaddafi in the CERT area, um, you know, that was Gaddafi's tribe. So in any area where a certain tribe or ethnic group or population was seen as having benefited from Gaddafi largesse, then that group is, you know, what in the aftermath of war was marginalized or seen as marginalized. And so they weren't, it's a similar situation like in Iraq with right. former Ba'athists where they have a sense of um, there, no buy-in into the state. Um, there's no, they feel a bit, they feel disenfranchised, particularly the way, and then again, you know, I haven't had one-on-one -on -one conversations with people in CERT, but that there was this sort of, um, you know, dynamic where uh, Miss Rotten's did not treat them very well, and so it was harder for them to take over. This goes back to your point about what else we need to do when it comes to diplomacy, when it comes to engagement with the population, when it comes to building trust between the government and those that have been uh, subjected to ISIS rule in these places. And so back to your point, um, what should be the engagement strategy? What should be the diplomatic strategy when it comes to taking these areas from ISIS, but yet adding them to the refugee exodus, adding them to the refugee problem? Well, <clears throat> I have been arguing a very unpopular um, position about I hear it. <laughs> Assad um, since 2013. I think, first and foremost, the ceasefire was, was should be the focus. Um, leaving it to play out this long as a humanitarian disaster was horrible and and it's a horrific on a scale that I think we're still gonna have to grapple with and not even I don't think we've begun to understand but I do think there's limitations as to what the US can do as far as taking back territory I think we do need to utilize um, our allies I think it is problematic to use proxies in some of those areas it's very hard to control um, when we're not there so it's not an easy answer as far as taking back territory. But I do think, um, as far as engagement, um, it's not even just about countering violent extremism you know, globally. It's also about dealing with people who have gone there, decided to, to leave the organization. We don't have proof that they conducted you know, any type of criminal activity that we would see as prosecuting. prosecuting. But I, do, I think we need to give them an off-ramp and a way to exit the group that would allow them a voice to then help others do the same thing. Right. And that's one of the, one of the requests with the ceasefire was for all U.S.-backed opposition forces to break ties with Jabal al-Nusra, who had already broken ties with al-Qaeda, uh, break ties with Akhral al-Sham, break, break ties with, with any ISIS groups that they were working with. But when you ask somebody to do something that difficult, and you're not there to protect them when you ask them to disengage from these groups, it's hard for them to do that. Well, I think it, it, let's discuss people who have actually done that themselves no. first, um, where they've, they've tried to disengage or actually have successfully done that and are trying to return back to their home country, whether it's Western Europe, the United States, right. um, instead of immediately prosecuting them based on what they were doing. I think that it's useful to have the discussion of, you know, what do we do with this person who's like an 18-year-old kid who got there, was completely disillusioned, was there for maybe two weeks, and, and now needs to figure out what to do with his life because he decided this is not the, the path. Right. Um, the other thing I would add is if you look at what Jabhat al-Nusra did inside of Syria where they were pro providing, this is what ISIS eventually ended up doing, all the goods and services for the local population, of course you are going to be greeted as, as somebody who is actually helpful for the community. So. Just like the invasion of Iraq, where we didn't really supply any type of resources initially, I think we have to do that 
whatever means you know is necessary to this population in general once we take that organization out right there's a vacuum left at that point well I would argue that when we get those individuals that you described that we make them sources for the agency or other groups to get them back in there be the eyes and ears of things you know to tell us what's actually going on there especially having come out of that there should be a reconciliation effort there should be a team that's able to designate reconcilables from irreconcilables when people leave these organizations the problem is the strongest tribe concept and you mentioned tribal structures in Libya the strongest tribal concept whoever whoever has the ability like you said to provide services or to punish somebody for leaving to bottle Nusra is able to do that these other groups are able to do that ISIS is able to do that so we ask these people to exit and you mentioned the militias in Misrata are they able to get people to exit these groups or is the punishment you used to be part of ISIS therefore you're a collaborator therefore your punishment is the same is there any reconciliation going on between these these elements not that I know of not on the part of Misrata no but and I don't think that that's a priority in Libya at all everything's about ready to fall apart in terms of the government structure that the government of national accord through which the United States is and international actors have tried to address the ISIS issue it's 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 not really functioning usually only well less than half of the presidential council show up to meetings and there was a round of talks in Tunisia that from what I hear didn't go very well so yeah it's on the part of the government or other towns I don't see that happening and part of it too is there had there has been some success in Libya where they're like tribal elders will get together between tribes and negotiate truces that has happened pretty frequently but it happens on very small scale the complicating factor with ISIS in Libya is that it's not homegrown like in Iraq and Syria it's it's in the beginning that people used to call them little fan clubs would pop up that they didn't think had any sort of operational links with ISIS in Iraq and Syria but it's you know a lot of the commanding forces there are foreign and there are Libyan members but so it doesn't the the effort by tribal leaders to try to you know convince a young person oh you know you don't want to do that you want to come to the good side it's not as easy because people there aren't the ISIS members aren't all Libyan and I would clarify I really meant that in context the United States and Western Europe where we have the resources we're not in the middle of a chaotic war it's come you know a totally separate issue right so as you look at this US ISIS strategy or the international community's strategy to defeat ISIS everybody's willing to commit an Air Force commit a fighter jet maybe commit some special operators on the ground some snipers but the default has been to use a proxy force and one of my biggest criticisms going back to 2005 2006 was that we were allowing too much of of the Iraqi security forces to become sectarian proxies for Shia militia parties we were allowing militia integration in 2006 into the Iraqi security forces and when when the generals in charge of Minstiki were Minstiki was the US effort to actually generate an Iraqi army and Iraqi National Police Corps in Iraq we're simply asking the question are you an Iraqi because they were trying to push this Iraqi nationalist theme we were asking if they were Iraqi and they were willing to fight al-Qaeda they were saying yes Maliki was asking if they were Sunni and if they were Sunni they were being purged especially around the Shia areas so that when we did Fallujah in 2004 2005 it mirrors this ISIS strategy now we rubbled a town we dispersed the population in order to disperse ISIS we didn't defeat al-Qaeda in 2005 and 2006 in Fallujah we simply dispersed them and 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 you've made points about that this strategy is doing that now but what happened in the surge and it goes back to what you were saying about tribal engagement strongest tribe before the surge al-Qaeda was the strongest tribe in the Sunni areas and the Shia militias were the strongest tribe in the Shia areas and the government was relatively weak and easily influenced by Shia militia parties the US government was using leverage to try to get everybody to work together but an engagement strategy took place where we actually 
gave Sunnis in occupied areas a choice. Uh, do you want to be part of something to expel al-Qaeda? Do you want to be empowered to expel al-Qaeda? And I'm sure you were part of that effort to, to, to work with uh, JSOC on vetting sources and, and looking at high-value targets within the al-Qaeda network. But this strategy is not giving Sunnis in Fallujah, Ramadi, to Crete, Mosul, Raqqa, Deir Azur, CERT, the opportunity to join an effort to expel ISIS. They're simply looked at as the governed, those that are being governed by ISIS. And please, please disagree with me here. I'm kind of, you know, one of my biggest criticisms here is this, admin, this administration's ISIS policy is one that depopulates Sunni areas to disperse ISIS, to replace it with a flag and call it a PR event. You can Google Ramadi today to create Fallujah, and you'll see ISIS cells still operating, sniper attacks still taking place, IED attacks in Baghdad, high-profile attacks. We can go to that next map. And this is one of the most important things about this ISIS strategy, <clears throat> is this is what ISIS is able to do now. Even though territory is being taken away, they're able to conduct these high-profile attacks. So my, my question to the panel is, as we take territory away from ISIS without putting those other tenants in place, such as engagement with the government, uh, using our regional allies to do more, um, are we actually defeating ISIS? Well, I think your comparison with Fallujah um, is, bear with me, a false yeah, yeah, comparison. Sure. We don't have people in Syria and Iraq right, right now to be able to do the same type of exactly. activity. Or the purges you were, you were referring to. So I think it would be next to impossible for us to employ that type of strategy inside of Syria or Iraq. Right well, now. we're using a proxy force to do exactly what we did in 2005. But so when we were there, we had more force, control over it. It's very small. Um, it's very difficult for them to move around because ISIS controls so much territory. Uh, they also have to deal with Assad. And this goes back to what I was saying about a ceasefire back in 2013, regardless if Assad would have been left in place, if we could have somehow negotiated a, cease, a ceasefire at that time, we at least maybe wouldn't be de you know, dealing with the humanitarian disaster and the, the type of territory that ISIS ended up capturing. Um, but that's hindsight. Today, I don't know what more the administration can do ourselves without putting military inside of Syria and Iraq. That is, that's fair. Um, the proxy forces is the issue. In Iraq, it's uh, primarily Shia militia-led force, the Hashid al-Shabi, the People's Mobilization Units. And in Syria, it's a combination of Hezbollah, even Iraqi Shia militias, and also Assad's forces. With the cover now with this recent uh, ceasefire, we're, we're agreeing to help uh, Putin and Assad take out Jabhat al-Nusra in Aleppo. But Deir Ezzur and Raqqa are not being targeted now. We're supposed to give this a test, and then if this ceasefire holds up, we're supposed to work together to defeat ISIS? Is that your understanding of this Syrian ceasefire? Or should I throw it back at myself and answer that question? <laughs> All right. So, so basically, um, I'm playing moderator or panelist also, because right we're, we're trying to make this, uh, this thing work. So... <laughs> Back to this, back to this proxy force. Yes, in Fallujah it was U.S. forces. The difference is, in Fallujah, when we told the civilians to leave Fallujah, they came towards us because we gave them medical help. We put them in U.S.-run uh, refugee temporary camps. In this operation, the residents of Ramadi, Tikrit, and Fallujah are going towards Mosul. They're going away from the government. They're not going towards the government. We were there, so that is one difference. So, so back to. How does, can ISIS survive with losing territory? Um, I would say, I would say yes, but the question is, is it going to be good enough to be able to take Raqqa, Deir Ezzur, and Mosul away from ISIS to say it's been defeated? So that's a comparison with Al Qaeda. Yes. Um, where ISIS has been largely operating as an overt organization. I mean, they have a government, a land army, um, services, they're also losing a little bit of funding because oil and gas is, revenue has dropped right. significantly. So a lot of this is extortion, which alienates the local population. So we have at least that going for us at this point. Um, the population is 
dissatisfied, at least at this point. Um, but I do think there's an iteration of ISIS that can exist. But it would go back to being a more covert organization similar to Al-Qaeda. Right. I don't think they have the expertise and the will to do to stay around as long as Al-Qaeda and conduct these one-off attacks necessarily if they lose a lot of that territory. I could see Al-Qaeda absorbing them eventually. Well, I'm going to come back to you on the competition between Al-Qaeda and ISIS uh, on that point. And so, okay, with, with Libya, give us some of the other places in, in Africa that ISIS is expanding in that we're, we need to be aware of. Um, so, um, uh, well, not just in Sirte and in the eastern part of the country, too, but also in Saprata in the west, uh, which is borders Tunisia. So uh, there have been cross-border incursions over the past couple of years. Is there years. strategic infrastructure there that ISIS is going after? Uh, no, the border town. The border town? Uh, yeah, because it, there are links, like, familial links there. It's sort of like here in Virginia. You know, we just cross a, a, a highway and, you know, we're, we're meeting our friends for lunch. It's similar. Um, uh, but I think the, the idea in Tunisia is similar now that they don't have um, CERT to be able to have, like, an ap actual geographical control. They're going to be more... They're going to try to do more things in Libya like they have done in Tunisia, where it's these sporadic attacks, just to create a, a sense of destabilization. So like things that happened with the Bartom Museum attack um, and events like that. Um, so there's Tunisia. It's not for infrastructure purposes, it's just to destabilize, um, to uh, disrupt the um, tourist community or the tourist uh, economy that, that Tunisia is so dependent upon. Um, also Algeria. So um, I, as one a, co a colleague of mine said, to, there is a lot of unfinished business that um, jihadists have in with regard to Algeria because of the war in the 1990s, the civil war between, uh, I mean, it's a very simplified way of saying it, but between Islamists and the government. Uh, and Al-Qaeda Al in the Maghreb is also still very present. So. Um, I think that there will probably be somewhat more of like a, a, a confrontation between ISIS, whatever is left of ISIS in Libya and North Africa and, uh, and Algeria. Yeah. AQIM, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but AQIM, from what I understand, has more of control over south, southern Algeria. Um, and, but the French have quite a large presence now in, in northern Mali, so there may be um, a way to sort of buffer that. But there's also Boko Haram in Nigeria. And also, it's, it's a weak point is Niger, the country just between Libya and Nigeria. Uh, it's not a very strong country. Um, it's allied with the United States on some things, with trainings, um, flintlock exercises. But in terms of having control over that northern border, there isn't any. Um, so there could be room, plenty of room for, uh, well, I mean, it's difficult, too, because there are Tuareg and Tebu tribes. But... Um, there is definitely space for uh, ISIS to be able to go southward into Libya and create networks with other groups in the region. Is it becoming less and less important for ISIS to put a flag up, to put a flag up and say this is ISIS-held territory, as they're quickly learning that if you put a, if you don't have the ability to shoot down an American aircraft, you shouldn't plant a black flag hmm. because you, you're likely to lose territory. We're seeing that. So are they becoming less and less dependent on taking over territory and actually becoming more capable, as the map suggests, as moving towards an Al-Qaeda model. Like a franchise? A franchise, high-profile attacks, and maintaining areas to plan and train. I, I think their central effort is still um, holding the holding caliphate ground. together. I mean, that's what they centered and built this whole organization around. So they lose face if, if they lose that territory. Uh, let's go. It would be difficult for them to sustain, I think, other operations because that's the bulk of their revenue. And, and let's go to what the administration has done over the last two years. I mean, uh, the main thing that you can't, you, can't, you can't say that they haven't been effective, meaning the United States military, our advisors, and these proxy forces, is – this strategy has taken land away from ISIS. It has hurt the brand. It has taken infrastructure away from ISIS. It has uh, hurt their oil revenues. Uh, Turkey demonstrated the ability to shut down a border uh, in the last two weeks that it didn't do for two and a half years. Uh, more so, I think the trigger was the YPG moving west of the Euphrates. But Turkey demonstrated an ability. And, of course, there was the, the high-profile attack, the wedding attack, that was linked to ISIS. So 
Uh, just so you know, so in Mosul uh, in 2014, an ISIS fighter was getting $500 a month, a car, and a cell phone. Now they're conscripting ISIS fighters at 50 bucks a month, and they're three months behind. So there are things that are working. Uh, foreign fighter flow, if you look at the metrics of foreign fighter flow, when ISIS was succeeding, foreign fighters were coming in. Foreign fighters don't rush to the caliphate to defend ISIS when it loses territory. They rush to the caliphate when it's having successes. So in that case, the territory is very important. So I don't see ISIS holding on to this territory, but I do believe ISIS will be able to maintain networks and inroads into these territories. I would say, well, that's largely true, built on um, Zarqawi's own organization. I mean, he pulled a lot from the Maghreb. He also pulled a lot from the Levant, himself being from Jordan. he That's where his networks. He was actually in Herat, Afghanistan, um, with his own camp. It was next to Al-Qaeda's, but he was not accepted into the Al-Qaeda camp. And a lot of his network at the time were North African, um, in addition to people from the Levant and Turkey. And he that network would still exist uh, today. But I still think that... Even Zarqawi had not built an extensive enough um, strategy for them to survive post. And I don't think ISIS has either. Right. But the, the one thing that ISIS... Do you have something to say on that? No, no, no. Go ahead. The one thing that ISIS does have going for it is that it's still able to tell that Exodus population that's left to Crete, Ramadi, Fallujah, uh, other places that ISIS has lost territory, sir, um, that your government is more against you now than ever. Um, your perceptions of the West are more entrenched than ever based on what we, we did in 2007 based on and the contrast of what we're doing now. In 2007, we, had, we targeted al-Qaeda and Shia militia members. Now we're working with Shia militia members to punish Sunni populations, to disperse ISIS fighters, and this whole push of Sunnis into the refugee population I mean, the Mosul Offensive is, is what? Uh, October is supposed to be the start date. And uh, the UN and, and every NGO is talking about, what are we going to do with the refugees? Well, I would argue, why do you need to have a refugee exodus from Mosul? Why don't we go back to what you did with the agency in 2000, uh, from 2002 to 2011, uh, recruit sources, uh, engage with the Sunni population to take back this territory, as opposed to saying, it's too bad that you're there, the operation is starting. Uh, we, we continue to rubble these towns. Uh, I don't know if was Sirte rubbled. It's pretty rubbled. Yeah. We were eighty percent of Ramadi is destroyed. Uh, Fifty percent of Fallujah is destroyed. Uh, to Crete, uh, ISIS learned the lesson: don't let your population leave. Uh, to Crete, I don't know how much is destroyed, but we're just not having that return of refugees. So during the surge, Sunnis came back to Iraq. Once these areas were please. But again, I think that is not. Um, equivalent, because we were there to be able to provide at least a safe haven for them to come back to. Um, I mean, we, you actually said this before. If they, you know, there's nothing there to protect them. Right. So asking them to come back, but yet not having the same type of protection, I think, is um, not really realistic. So I mean, the, the strategy is both taking territory from ISIS, but also increasing the exodus of refugees into into Europe. I don't I, did you say strategy? I would hope that's not a strategy. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're, we're looking it is, for we're awfully yeah. successful. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> did you have anything to say about that? Uh, I just want one thought that came to mind. Actually I wanted to as a disclaimer too um, that I, I did research in Libya. I didn't oversee the transition. That sounded right. a lot more important than the, than what I actually did. But I was there a couple times in 2012. Um, don't diminish, it's DC. That sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that I think a lot of what might happen with um, in North Africa between AQIM and uh, ISIS might be come down to ego battles too, because you've got big personalities that think that they own the narrative, and so that will probably part, be part of the dynamic going forward. I just wanted to sort of... Ego's on the ISIS side of the house? Both sides, DC yeah. side of the house. <laughs> That's a good point, right? <laughs> I mean, you could, we saw that, you're right, with the Zawahiri message recently as well. I mean, he's disparaging ISIS in that, um, talking about we should all unify, but what he really means under the Al-Qaeda umbrella. Hmm. 
So going back to the competition question to both of you, uh, I'll ask you if there's competition between Al Qaeda and Libya, uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS in Libya and other places in North Africa. But now, the, the competition in in as ISIS turns to an Al Qaeda model, do you see them aligning with Al Qaeda at some point, or will it be competition? Will I think there's obvious competition between the two organizations. I think it'll just depend largely on what the franchises decide to do. Um, if you take away that territory in Syria and Iraq, will it be more lucrative for them to join Al-Qaeda? It's like the rebranding that bin Laden ended up having to do with Al-Qaeda. There's a lot of franchises of Al-Qaeda now that are not called Al-Qaeda anything. Mm. Um, ISIS will have the same problem. They won't be able to be called ISIS um, or want to. Uh, so I think it, it will really depend on where the brand stands. And again, if they don't have the funding from the organization, I mean, Al-Qaeda has long-standing uh, funding. I don't see where it would really benefit them to remain under that umbrella. Do you see, do you see, so as you look at the map with the high-profile attacks, do you see that continuing? Do you see that to be, for there to be more attacks in order to, to offset the loss of territory? I don't know that it's necessarily in, in retaliation to the loss of territory. I think that's always been part of their agenda. The West has always been part of their agenda. Um, will there be more? I think it really does depend on what the West does with some of the returning members um, in Europe and the United States. I think it depends on um, if ISIS continues to uh, incite some of the people and direct them. I think we're also not seeing some of the communications that you know covertly could be happening between them and people who have never left the United States or Europe or. So you see fracturing, splintering, different groups, just like the Al Qaeda. Um, largely because of the rebranding. Right. I don't see it as as disgruntlement, but again, I don't see where ISIS really has anything attractive once they lose that territory to maintain. So the Islamic State on the road, as opposed to in Iraq and Al Sham. So, in Libya, is it is it an affiliate in Libya and these other places where ISIS is standing up to both of you? Are they affiliates, or they did ISIS actually send leadership, key leadership from Raqqa and Deir ez in Iraq to Libya to stand these organizations up? Uh, in Libya, it was both. So, um, it the first um, group to you know pronounce fealty to ISIS was the Islamic Sharia Youth Council of Derna in March of 2014, and then um, they were able to take over Derna in uh, October of 2014. Um, so that's one case, but there's also, there were, was also movement from uh, Iraq and Syria. Um, there was a, a brigade called the Batar Battalion that was only Libyan members that was fighting in Syria, and then its members slowly started filtering back into Libya. Um, and if the argument at the time was that, oh, no, they'll never let Libyans go back home that have been fighting because if, they're, if anybody actually left Syria, they were, you know, they'd be offed. Um, but that was all part of the strategy all along. So uh, it was both. In Libya, it was definitely both. And in that, at least in the east, and then they got kicked out of Derna and then moved to Sirte. Um, but all of the other wilayats, the one in Tripoli in the West, ended up, I think that was in November, just shortly after November of 2014. But it was like 10 guys and some guns and some really old trucks. You know, and then it, it devolved from there. Evolved from there, not devolved, sorry. Adam, can you put that last map up, showing the affiliates? So as you look at foreign fighter flow, you're seeing a lot of, of countries that ISIS intentionally didn't stand up affiliates in, in, uh, in, in 2014 because they didn't want to disrupt that foreign fighter flow into the caliphate. Now, because of the loss of ter territory and the, the hit on the brand uh, in Iraq and Syria, you're starting to see more of a presence in these places. And my question is, do these other groups gain primacy over, over the leadership in Raqqa and Deir ez as they're able to actually hold territory or get new territory? Because what is, what is the impact to the brand of losing Raqqa if they lose Raqqa and losing Mosul? What is, how does that impact ISIS leadership and Baghdadi in particular? Well, if they do lose Raqqa, I think they are definitely on the brink. Um, they, I don't know how they're going to come back if they lose both of those territories. But I think some of the affiliates that you were talking about, um, 
I'm sure it varies by affiliate on how much autonomy each of them has. Um, I would guess that the model in Libya is probably very similar to what many of the affiliates have had, given what Zarqawi's old network um, pulled from. Okay. Well, we've talked about a lot here. What we really wanted to, to convey is that defeating ISIS isn't simply taking territory from ISIS. It will hurt them, yes. It will disrupt them. It will, it will uh, decrease foreign fighter flow. But as you heard here, uh, al-Qaeda is still present, still the premier. Would you call it the premier terrorist organization? Or would you say ISIS is now? No, I, I think al-Qaeda is in this for the long haul. And I think they have a much more sophisticated structure. So, so as you look at the, what happens to ISIS, it's, it's more than just losing territory. So we're going to open up the questions now to the audience. And what I'd like for you to do, when you, when you ask questions, stand up, wait for the microphone to get to you, and then identify yourself. Yes, sir. This gentleman here up front. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Cammy Butt. I'm with the Pakistani Spectator. And my question is about Donald Trump's very recent statement about uh, Obama's inaction and uh, how, by his inaction, he nurtured uh, ISIS. And my question is in the light of Neda, you know, about Middle East. Most people, or let's say brown people, believe that uh, it was designed by the CIA. And uh, since, you know, I don't know how much you know about intelligence, but like many Pakistani believe that Indian research analyst Wing Ra is involved in Pakistani Balochistan. Pakistani think, Indian think that Pakistani ISI is involved in Indian Kashmir. Similarly, Nada knows that Ham Hamas was designed by Israeli Mossad. There was a guy named Hafiz Yasin, Hafiz al Quran, and he was picked up leader by Mossad. So my question is that what Donald Trump said, most American don't take it very seriously. But I think he is going to be the most honest president uh, in American history because he blurred out. So his, what he said about the, the ISIS is kind of supported or validated by the people in third world and uh, people in the Middle East. My friend Jasmine, her specialty is Turkey, and she will tell you privately that most Turkish believe that CIA is involved in the recent coup in Turkey as well. So. After 40 or 50 years, when most of us are dead, many people are going to know that CIA has fingerprint everywhere about ISIS. Okay, I think I get the, the, the gist of the sense question. of the question. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll comment first, and I'll pass it to you. I think I think everybody gives the agency way too much credit for for these strategies. You know, uh, with the WikiLeaks thing, they had Afghan politicians and military guys come up to CIA officials and say. Great job on that WikiLeaks thing to make sure we never talk to the State Department again. You know, those types of things, you know, we, we, we back, can I say this, back ass into these successes, so to speak, or, the, or these, uh, these perceived CIA involvement and successes in these things. Um, the one thing I would say about Iraq in 2008 is we started letting a lot of militia and bad guys go, and we were directed to uh, as part of an organization called the Force Strategic Engagement Cell, where we had a no vote on reconcilables and irreconcilables. And we didn't want to let uh, certain people go, but we were told well, let them go. And it turns out a lot of these these militiamen that we were letting go were at the request of Iran through the Maliki government, and it added to instability. And then we saw the targeting of the Sons of Iraq and the Awakening. We saw Maliki start purging effective Kurdish and Sunni commanders from the Iraqi security forces, leaving a security void that something was going to fill, and ISIS filled that. I will tell you that was not by design. That's just because, you know, things happen that way when, you're, when your experts are given the title of expert after being in the country for three months or for six months. And... and that's one of the biggest problems with these with these things, and I'll I'll send it to to you there. Cool. Okay, and that's a typical CIA answer. Perfect. <laughs> okay. We can discuss okay. the DIA CIA question. Yeah, we, I was with the DIA, the Discount Intelligence Agency, <laughs> but I'll I'll pass it to the CIA. Well, I don't work there anymore, and I will tell you. Um, while I was there. Um, 
I think you are giving too much credit to the invisible hand that everyone ascribes to. Um, I mean, you've seen how the U.S. government functions, right? Through WikiLeaks, through Snowden. Right. <laughs> yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Um, All right. But I would say, in Iraq, uh, given my time while I was in Iraq, uh, even while we're present and we have thousands of Americans running around the country, we had very little effect on the safety and security for the average Iraqi. Um, so to Donald Trump's comment of nurturing ISIS, that is so overblown and over the top. I think to me that just says he doesn't understand the problem. On one hand, yes, it's frustrating that we haven't done more. Um, to stop this. And again, for me, it's the humanitarian issue of this. Uh, you know, just the ceasefire alone a long time ago would have been beneficial. But Trump knows more than the generals, though. Right? Trump, Trump is going to bomb ISIS so hard they're going to be tired of dying. Right, right. So, well, but you have that, right? I mean, right. you end up with somebody who could possibly make that even more of a desert. Like, no one lives there because it's just such a catastrophic event. So be careful what you wish. We, we can all argue that every candidate so far to include our, I guess you mentioned strategy, our, our current president has not dealt with ISIS appropriately or not. Or Al-Qaeda. Or Al-Qaeda. Al this has been going on way prior to when we were born. And Bush time frame as well. And um, the candidates haven't really out, you know, outlined their strategy either. But we'll go to a, another question. Sir? Tell me here. Uh, please stand up and identify yourself. Thank you. I'm Dave Rabinowitz. I'm retired. And uh, I remember right after the uh, Iraq invasion. Retired military or? No, just retired. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just after the invasion of Iraq, Muqtada al Sadr had his uh, Mahdi army, which nobody called the Mahdi army. It was re referred to as the private militia of Muqtada al Sadr. And he never recruited anybody from outside. Now we have something that started out basically as the private army of Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the private militia, but they gave it the name ISIS or IS, and people have been basically using that name rather than calling it the private militia of, uh, well today, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, and all the affiliates are basically the private militias of whatever local tribal warlords there is. And if we refer to them as the private militia of whatever warlord, rather than giving them this overblown uh, status of Islamic State, uh, which gives them cachet and all that, wouldn't they be much less successful in recruiting? Good point. That's a great point. I mean, we, we, we call them the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, and they are not mm -hmm. in the Levant permanently. Um, I call it ISIS because ISIL just doesn't seem right to me. I like uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, and of course everybody says that's all Sham, which means the Levant and the Daesh is a derogatory term, but Daesh is actually the acronym in Arabic, you know, Delta Islamia, Fi Iraq al Sham. Probably mispronounced it, but that's how I'm going to say it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's a great point. The problem is uh, that was recommended to state in 2014 not to call them that, and they still call them. But I, I would add to that, um, they aren't just a private militia. I mean, this is, a lot of them were foreign fighters. They're not made up of Iraqis or Syrians necessarily. So this isn't, what's that? I think right. the franchises, the small little groups. Right, I think yeah. that would probably be more relevant there. And I think there, like we know, with Adnani, that was somebody that had been there since um, the time of Zarqawi, you know, trying to build this network and organization. So I'm not defending calling it ISIS. I'm saying I think it's more than a private militia. That would be discounting the impact that they have on the country. <clears throat> Joel Rayburn of the National Defense University has the best description for ISIS, uh, Zarqawi's death cult and its franchises. Uh, at least I like it. All right, next question. Yes. I'll come to you afterwards. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Brooke. I work in the office of Representative Will Hurd. Um, I'm, not, I'm not an expert or a panelist. Maybe to the last question, I would just also add that um, ISIS is also more than, like you said, just a militia. It also has a governing structure and actually has released videos with um, 
detailing sort of how that governance structure works and the goods and services it provides to the citizens. Not that they're actually good, but so my question is directed at Nada. I'm curious to know your thoughts on Ayman al-Zawahiri, who released a video a few weeks ago calling on Iraqis to continue to have hope, you know, support the organization of al-Qaeda. Obviously, you guys were talking about the competition and the rifts between ISIS and al-Qaeda, and I'm just wondering, who was he targeting? What is al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan trying to do in Iraq, given ISIS's rise and pretty obvious split from the al-Qaeda organization? Again, I don't work for the agency anymore, so this is just my opinion. But I think part of who he was focusing on talking to were the citizens that are becoming disgruntled with ISIS. Like I said, oil revenue used to be their large cachet of cash. Now it's extortion, and they're alienating the local population, and I'm sure al-Qaeda is very aware of that at this point. So I think part of it is trying to attract more people back to al-Qaeda. I think some of it obviously was around the 9-11 anniversary, his messaging. But what was the second part of your question? I can't remember now. Right. Using this as an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I think he's absolutely, he's of course talking globally. But yes, I think he's trying to capitalize on the ISIS downturn. Remember when Zarqawi was cutting the heads off of Sunnis and punishing the Anbar tribes in Iraq, it was Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden who said he was being too brutal. And Zarqawi pushed, I'm sorry, yeah, Zarqawi pushed back. And there is some talk amongst the intelligence community that Osama bin Laden and Zawahiri were a little bit more lax in their communications to Zarqawi so that they could be intercepted. And it might have led to Zarqawi's targeting because he was becoming unmanageable. He was not listening to senior leadership. The Abbottabad raid documents talk about what you described. There were lessons learned from al-Qaeda on what they did in Iraq and how to do it, lessons that ISIS didn't put in place. One of the major things was do not punish Sunnis, do not target other Muslims to include the Shia sect, primarily Iran. Do not target Iran because there were key facilitation routes. And who is he talking to? I think he's talking to a lot of those tribal structures that now have no place to go. ISIS is going away. They're not fighting for these territories. Sunni population has become part of the refugee exodus. And they don't have more faith and trust in their government now. And maybe that's who he's reaching out to. That's who I try to reach out to. Hussam? Or Abe, I'm sorry. Abe Shulsky. I'm a senior fellow here at Hudson. In terms of the question of what the importance would be of taking the territory away from ISIS, you mentioned the sort of political ideological issue. I think it would be a big blow because the whole caliphate notion depends on actually controlling territory. And if you take that away, I think you take away a lot of the attraction. But the other question would be how important is controlling territory for the ability to do terrorism elsewhere? In other words, where would the ISIS leadership wind up? What would be their Pakistan, so to speak, if they had to become like an al-Qaeda? I mean, that's a good question. And I would look at one of the affiliates, maybe just like AQAP in Yemen has become one of the main operational directive organizations for al-Qaeda at large. And I would think it would be one of the affiliates. I'm not sure which one is the strongest at this point and which one actually adheres to the whole ISIS command structure. I do think they would continue attacks outside of Iraq and Syria as long as they're around and the brand is still around if they have some kind of affiliate stronghold. But again, I think they would resort to being a more covert organization then at that point. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think they can definitely do things. It will just be a lot less coordinated. They might even have little neighborhoods 
um, of towns, but not like a whole town or something like that. And like you said, go under go underground. They're a lot less visible. But I, I don't think in any way that they're going to stop committing any sort of or that not having territory would limit their capacity to be able to, to, to carry out attacks. If you look at where they've stood up in the territory they've lost in Iraq and Syria, they're still able to, con to conduct training, planning, and uh, coordinate high-profile attacks from other areas. If you look at an ISIS map of territory controlled, that whole part will be black. Every country will just have a black flag over it. ISW does ISIS a disservice by actually showing where they are and where we can actually conduct these, these strikes. So uh, I agree with both panels that they'll be able to maintain the capability to conduct these high-profile attacks. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, the guy that- I would disagree about high-profile. I don't think they've done really high, necessarily high-profile in the sense of number of casualties. Right, but- right. Outside of Iraq. Outside of Iraq. Just gentlemen here, and then back to you, sir. Alex Shalabi, Tahrir Institute. I'm sorry, Hassan. Hassan is not here. I uh, know, uh, me too. <laughs> question to the panel is, does the, do the panelists believe there's a significant ideological difference between Al-Qaeda and, and ISIS? I mean, one calls itself an Islamic state, a caliphate. Does, do you believe that uh, Al-Qaeda has a different uh, agenda, I mean, a, a significantly different, or are they basically the same, just different names? I'll throw it to you and then I'll come back. I think they have different agendas. Um, Al-Qaeda, even under Zawahiri now, is still very focused on the West and the United States. They're still very focused on um, various stages before they get to a caliphate. I mean, they've got, they've had those lessons planned out for quite some time. Say Pilatel was also instrumental in doing that, trying to also convey that to Zarqawi, which he also ignored, and the Islamic State jumped about six of those steps. Um, and I would also say that Al-Qaeda and ISIS share a similar ideology, but they do have some distinctions on who they consider to be an authority on certain issues. They're picking and choosing. I think Al-Qaeda has a um, much more, um, I would say, sophisticated and, and coherent ideology. The one thing from the Abbottabad documents, if you, if you look at it, you talk, go back to your lessons learned. Osama bin Laden Zawahiri said, you don't establish a caliphate until you can pay everybody in the caliphate, when you give them a job, and you can feed them. That's very important. Um, when it comes to ISIS and al-Qaeda recruitment, um, the Jabhat al-Nusra affiliate of al-Qaeda in Syria doesn't just let anybody join. You have to be vouched for. You have to be in your Islamic studies. You have to have a, a certain a certain uh, status, and you have to be proven as a fighter. Uh, they have a process, I think it's called the 30 days of, it's basically a mini ranger school where it's sleep deprivation, food deprivation, and, and they want to ensure that you can actually do this. ISIS will take anybody, at least that's what Because they are a land or, yeah. Right, because they take anybody. You're, you're welcoming families to come live in the caliphate, and the families aren't coming anymore because you can't protect them from uh, U.S. airstrikes or Russian airstrikes. Um, yes. Jackson, yes, sure. I, I, um, so I, I look at this a lot more simply and probably rude. I know that, um, uh, you know, there are all, are all of these tactical and operational distinctions. Um, I think the, 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 that the push-pull factors are similar for both organizations, where it's um, in Al-Qaeda's older, and so the, the leadership is older. Um, but I think those push-pull factors are still similar where you have a lot of young people who don't feel that um, they are a part of the system in which they live, the political system in which they live, uh, and feel that it's, um, you know, their governments are, if they're living in the Middle East, that their governments are puppets of Western governments, or and if they're living in Europe or the United States, that, um, you know, that they don't feel a part of, of you know, the area, the, the country they live in. Um, so that's one pull factor. Um, you know, poverty is another one. There are all these different push-pull factors I think drive people to do things. And actually, this is a debate that's going on between those two French scholars, and I can't remember their names. But uh, that, that one believes that there's been an Islamic, Islamicization of, of extremism, and another person says, another scholar says that there's been an extremism of uh, extremization of Islam. So there are two different ways to look at it, and I tend to sort of feel like it's more of an Islamization of extremism than the other way around. 
Let me give one example with Boko Haram. The Abbottabad documents again talk about this. Zawahiri was pushing bin Laden to accept Boko Haram as an al-Qaeda affiliate. And Osama bin Laden said, no, they're, they were, they're not disciplined. They're not qualified to be part of our organization. And then Boko Haram became an ISIS affiliate. Uh, Zawahiri had lost a lot of credibility. After. I mean, he's not the charismatic leader that Osama bin Laden was. Uh, and Zawahiri is not able to, to get groups to do certain things. But that, that was an interesting thing, because now Boko Haram is an ISIS affiliate, and Zawahiri was always an advocate for them to become an al-Qaeda affiliate. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Namo Abdullah with Rudao from Kurdistan. So I just want uh, your analysis of the significance of the Turkish incursion in, uh, into Jarablus. Because I, I believe this is uh, very little attention has been paid to the Turkish involvement. And the attention that has been paid to has been basically a praise. Uh, and some people have called it a game changer, that Turkey is finally stepping up against ISIS. But uh, like it seems to me that supporting the Turkey-backed uh, rebels, FSA, into fighting ISIS uh, may, may sound a political maybe a politically sound decision, but it's hardly a strategic one if the end goal is to defeat ISIS. Firstly, because FSA is not interested in, in fighting ISIS as much as it is in fighting Assad. Secondly, this is already this already seems to be weakening the most effective partner the United States has on the ground, simply the YPG. Why is the United States supporting this this in, uh, endeavor? Thank you. Okay, uh, all right, so Turkey demonstrated the ability to shut down a part of its border that it didn't for two and a half years in the area of Adrabos. And uh, most analysts think it was more based on the YPG's successes there and that the YPG, a red line, was crossing the Euphrates. It was a red line for the Turkish government. Um, the one thing that I've noticed and you mentioned this uh, when it comes to CERT and other places where ISIS has lost territory. Each proxy force that we've worked with has negotiated an ISIS exodus from the area to be taken back. And we saw that in Fallujah, we saw that in Ramadi, we saw that in Tikrit, we saw that in CERT, and we saw that in Jerubus with Turkey crossing the border to do this. It, was more, it actually allowed ISIS a chance to regroup. It gave them space to regroup. Um, you know, Mike, Mike Morell says it's serious, too hard to do, because on any given day you can be on the right side or the wrong side supporting anyone. Uh, and right now, if you look at Syria, uh, the ceasefire right now, and you, you mentioned how important it is, is based on the ability for the U.S. to tell the YPG and to tell the FSA and to tell other opposition forces not to attack Assad's forces, not to attack um, each other, to only focus their attacks on ISIS, while the U.S. helps Assad and Russia punish, and I, I say punish, I guess I sound biased, punish the Sunni population center in Aleppo to go after Assad's enemies, Jabhat al-Nusra. So Turkey's incursion is more about um, protecting its border, uh, curbing the successes of the YPG. But where are the ISIS casualties from Jerubles? Where, where, I know Turkish tanks have been hit by ISIS uh, weaponry. Uh, so I, I, I want that to prompt them to do something. But it, it's really hard to see how any of this makes any sense or how any of this is a strategy. Well, like you said earlier, I, it's, I almost want to throw the question back at you. Like, what do you think? <laughs> but all right, next question. Sir. You want to comment? Uh, she wanted to make a comment. Oh, yes. Oh, you can. <laughs> Just pretend it's private. It's off the record. <laughs> uh, thank you for all uh, for allowing us to be here today. My name is Jesse. I'm a recent born scholar of the Middle East uh, returning. Uh, my, my question is, without a U.S. presence on the ground um, in a large tribal population in, like, in the south of Syria and Dara and in the east as well, um, what roles do the tribes play in Syria, also in Libya? Um, and pushing ISIS out of territory, but also in kind of the long term, what do they play in storing more or less non-ISIS-affiliated Sunni power in those areas? 
I mean, I guess my first question would be how how intact are the tribes in Syria at this point? You know, with their, with the exodus, um, with slaughter on both sides, I think it's hard to tell what what power and impact they would actually have. I mean, it's not like Anbar. It's tough to get tribes to do things when you're telling them you're going, to, you want them to do something, meaning Western special operations advisors, uh, asking them to do very difficult things without the frequency and proximity of, of trust and the longevity. You, you, you know, we've seen it in Afghanistan where, where the tribes will tell us the Taliban's going to be here after you leave, so we're not going to do many difficult things. And we tell the tribes to do something in Iraq, and then we announce a withdrawal date, or, or they see what happened post-surge when they, they helped us decapitate al-Qaeda, and then we abandoned the Sons of Iraq and the Awakening to be targeted not only by the Baghdad government and Shia militias and al-Qaeda remnants, but also to face reprisal attacks from al-Qaeda members who joined ISIS when ISIS rolled into Iraq. So we're about as effective as we are frequent and as effective as we are right there with the tribes. You can get somebody to do very difficult things if you're there with them, but don't expect them to be doing the same thing a week later if you're not there. We had some of those same problems, though, when we were there with them. I mean, we can't wholesale protect everybody at all times. No, no. We can't even wholesale protect ourselves. So I would say that that um, gives false hope on what the Americans or Western powers can actually do in the Middle East. That's well, true. I don't think any of the tribes operate on hope. I think all the tribes are very pragmatic. You're asking me to do something very difficult, you're going to leave. Assad's forces are going to stay here. Hezbollah is in the south. Uh, Shia pro Shia Iranian proxies are, are in Syria. The YPG is going to stay. Some form of al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra, ISIS is going to remain. So, you know, 250 special operators, as great as they are, aren't enough to build that trust and to ask them to do very difficult things. And I think our strategy is based on hope, and the tribal strategy is based on pragmatism. With regard to Libya, yes. I think that, and I, I don't know Syria and Iraq as well, nearly as well as you know Libya, but I think the situation's a little bit different, that you don't need special forces telling any of the tribes to fight ISIS. They'll do that on their own. Because they don't want them there. They, they see ISIS, and again, a lot of this goes back to ISIS not being homegrown in Libya like it is in Syria and Iraq, that they see it as a foreign a foreign uh, invasion and don't want it there. So, um, you know, Fred Wahery, a, a Libya expert at the Carnegie Endowment, has said this several times, that it's from like, you know, the, 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 the landscape of Libya, Libya and how um, um, fractionalized it is, is both a, uh, um, a force for ISIS to grow and at the same time a hindrance to it because there isn't unity, but that same disunity allows, uh, to, it allows ISIS to grow, but the same disunity because the militias are so, um, and, and tribes are so bent on keeping their own piece of territory, or they, you know, they're, they're protective of it. They've been there a long time, right? So uh, that, that, that sort of keeps ISIS at bay. It's a way of um, managing it. That's, that's, that's an interesting point, because in Iraq, ISIS has primacy. They're the only Sunni insurgent group or Sunni Islamist group that's operating. Everything else has fallen under the umbrella or gone to ground. And in Syria, you have Jabal al-Nusra, Akhar al-Sham, the FSA, all these different groups. How many groups are there in Libya? Dozens. So there's about 15 disparate Sunni jihadist groups competing. So it would make more sense for the tribes to go after ISIS because ISIS isn't the only thing there. Yeah, and I think, I mean, at least a couple of years ago, and I don't know what the general sentiment na is now, but in, at least a couple of years ago, most Libyans wanted to see united Libya. I think that that was a general goal, and I don't know that that's been the case in Iraq for quite some time. So I think that it's it's just a bit different. Yeah, that the, the context is different. Sir. Yeah, I'm Don Dan, a retired from the government, a retired professor. <clears throat> It seems to me from listening to this, but everything you read, you know, elsewhere and so forth, that the number of variables is just simply too hard for us to be able to comprehend and be able to deal with or to understand. You have you know, huge numbers of groups, as you were just saying, you've got 15 different groups here and you've got all these other groups here, that kind of thing. All these individuals, whether they're private militias or, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. And it just strikes me, <clears throat> it just strikes me that in a lot of ways, Americans, are over trying. In other words, we can't control the problem. We can't even come up with a good diagnosis. 
And maybe instead of each asking each other, well, what's your strategy? What's your strategy? If somehow we ought to jump in and do something, maybe we ought to say, hey, my strategy is like no strategy or pull back. And you know what? If there's somebody that doesn't like somebody else in, in that particular part of the world, somebody does, fine, let them take care of it. You know what I mean? Is, in other words, there are so many people that seem to be more involved in, uh, frankly, if I can put it this way, hating each other in those regions, and we can't pick winners, it seems to me, then let them sort it out, you know, on their own. You know, we're spending huge amounts of treasury. You know, we discover, I forget, when ISIS took over a town, you know, all of the trucks and the materials are all American materials that we had given into them and so forth. When I was involved in the government, I saw more stuff go to the wrong people than I'd want to talk about. And my sense would be, okay, well, let's not send stuff even to the right people because we can't control them and they can't control themselves and they sure tell us what we want to hear. So if I were, you know, Hillary or if I were uh, uh, Trump, I'd say, you know, I think my strategy is like no strategy. But don't ask me what my strategy is because that's the wrong question. So your question is strategy, no strategy? Yeah, it, you know, essentially, in other words, my pol you know, you were asking about what should be the strategy, what should be the policy. And my feeling would be you're making an assumption that there ought to be one or there ought to be something that we're actively going out right. to do you're that. Right, you're thinking initially. And I don't think so. The thinking, in the, the thinking initially in Syria was we'll let Hezbollah and Jabhat al-Nusra fight, fight it out. Had no idea ISIS would become part of this. Had no idea post-Iran deal, Russia would become part of this. We had no idea Turkey would become part of this and the YPG and all these different dynamics. So I just take issue with the let them all fight themselves because there's regional spillover implications for... It's their region. In other words, if Iran has a problem, if Saudi Arabia has a problem, if Turkey has a problem, it's their region, not ours. You know, they're the principal stakeholders, not us. I completely agree with that, what, what, the piece of what you just said. It is, they are the, the stakeholders. I think it's delusional to think that the United States is going to swoop back in there and fix everything. We didn't fix everything. Not in Afghanistan, not in Iraq, and it has nothing to do with the continual presence. We aren't wanted permanently in any of those places. So I would say we also haven't had a diagnosis. I completely agree with you. When it comes to terrorism as we define it, we haven't completely diagnosed the problem. And so it's really hard to come up with a solution for any of that. Can I chime in? Yeah. Um, so I completely see where you're coming from. I agree with that. I saw something the other day, and I can't rem I don't know, I can't quote it, and I don't know how valid it is, but that you're more likely to either be struck by lightning or killed by a lawnmower than to be attacked by a jihadist in, on American soil. So I see where you're coming from. Um, but lawnmowers don't rank number one. Well, actually, my cousin was struck. Actually, I think the number one was that you would be killed by a toddler. All right, let me get, let me get control of this again. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so I see where you're coming from. And, you know, it, of course, hindsight is always twenty twenty. And looking at the situation in CERT, for example, I think the whole thing it could have been handled more differently. You know, rather than going in and saying we need to we need to send in airstrikes, it's I think rather than pulling back, I think what a good a good strategy would be is to just take take a step back and think and pause for a second and look at the big picture and and think about what's important and what matters. And we have statistics that you know point to you know that I'm more likely to be hit by a bus. Than, than by a, an American jihadist, then maybe we need to refocus attention a little bit. Not to take our eye off of it completely and say, okay, well, I've heard the Latimerot strategy. I don't agree with it. Um, uh, I think it's, a, it's somewhere in the middle. But I do agree with you completely that there has to be a moment where we just take a step back and stop acting and, like, getting all trigger happy and just bombing things and, and take a different, more holistic approach to... I'll take an evil... Go for I'll it. Take on that <laughs> real quick. So, not <laughs> so there are 400,000 deaths in Syria because we did exactly that. We stood back and we let these things happen. There's 400,000 civilian deaths in Syria. Uh, we did see that the surge worked. And now the one thing that those of us that worked the surge in Iraq have said from the beginning is the last thing the United States should do is provide air cover to Iranian Shia proxies as they take back these towns from ISIS. So that's what we've done. So in that case, I completely agree with you that we – the IRIS strategy in Iraq, we shouldn't have done any of it because we're simply resetting the conditions that led to ISIS to begin with. The Sunni population is more distrustful than ever of Baghdad, now more distrustful of, of us. And I would argue that they don't want us there uh, in Iraq 
in particular, we're being begged to come back by the Sunni population in Iraq, by the Kurdish population in Iraq, by Shia nationalists. But the government, there's too much pressure on the government by Iran and these other uh, uh, Shia political parties to keep that from happening. It doesn't mean we should do that in Libya. It doesn't mean we should do that in Syria. But there are 20 million Sunnis of the northern Middle East that are looking to the U.S. and saying, hey, you know, what are you doing? I, I went to refugee camps in Turkey and Iraq, and I asked, I want to speak to former Sunnis who were in the Sons of Iraq, the Awakening, the Iraqi Security Forces, that blame America for what's happening now. I did this in Turkey with, with, with Sunni military-age males. I want unwed Sunni military-age males to tell us how this is America's fault. And I got them in the room. How many of you guys think this is America's fault? America's fault? They all raise their hand. How many of you think America should do something about it? They all raise their hand. So there is that dynamic at play. There's, there's the sit back and, and let Hezbollah and Jabhat al-Nusra fight until Jabhat al-Nusra becomes Ahr al-Sham, ISIS, these other groups. So there's something, there's a role for the U.S. to play, but there's also a correct role for the U.S. to play. And it's not an invasion. It's not 100,000 forces, but it is an intelligence-driven operation. What we argued last week here at Hudson is that the Mosul operation, again, everybody's worried about 1.2 million refugees from Mosul. Let's do it the right way. Let's slow it down. Let's make an intelligence-driven operation where we decapitate ISIS key leaders, bring in Sunni recruits, put pressure on Baghdad to uh, basically bring back the U.S.-trained Sunnis at Maliki Purge back into the third Iraqi Army Division and the second Iraqi Army Division. There's no reason for a refugee crisis in Mosul. We're not doing it right. I agree with you. We shouldn't do a thing in Mosul if this is how we're going to do it. Let's do it right. Let's do all these things right. Where we're not wanted, let's not go there. But let's also identify where we can actually simply, like you said, go back to historical events that actually show how we're supposed to do these things and learn from our mistakes. Uh, the one thing you, ta you talked about earlier with al-Qaeda ideology, Osama bin Laden had lessons learned and actually went back 20 years and said, this is what we should do if we want to establish a caliphate. We think it's ancient history if it happened 72 hours ago. You know, we need to, we need to remember our history, remember what worked, and go where we're, we're wanted and, and do it right. If we're not going to do it right, get the hell out. I want to say one more thing, and then I'll leave it. Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't think the conditions exist. Actually, the gentlewoman's able... time has expired. <laughs> oh, go ahead. You're good. All right. <laughs> no, you're good. Go. <laughs> um, I don't think the conditions exist to be able to do what you're prescribing. Um, that... Yeah. A slow intelligence-driven operation. Well, first of all, I think I think what we're hearing out in the news is that there is a, an intelligence-driven operation. I think that's what you're getting with the proxies as well. So you're talking about it's militia generated intelligence. It's not U.S.-driven intelligence. It's not Asaish intelligence from the Kurds. Okay, it's, wait. It's Shia militia intelligence saying so, that town is ISIS. Let's blow up the whole town instead of that room and that hotel. Well, also the army does not exist to put those people back in place. Those. So many of those guys have been co-opted and bought into the ideology right. of ISIS or Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So those people don't exist any longer. I don't think the conditions exist for that specific solution. And I don't think that we should just pull away entirely, especially when it comes to the humanitarian issues. Well, there are 350,000 military Jamels in Mosul that have not joined ISIS. ISIS is estimated by the agency to be 8,000 fighters, with the majority of them being foreign fighters. Uh, I, I talked about this last week. We were on a patrol, and I said, are there any foreigners in Mosul? And foreigners was always the key word for local Iraqis to tell us about al-Qaeda. And they looked at me and said, no, just you guys, the Americans and the, the Peshmerga forces we were fighting with. So there are 350,000 Sunni military-age males in Mosul that have not joined ISIS that could simply be recruited to say, hey, where are the key leadership at? We slow it down, make an intelligence-driven operation. We don't disperse the population, and Mosul turns on ISIS once empowered. But the real leverage is what you talked about earlier, that diplomatic push to get Baghdad to accept those Sunnis back in the Iraqi security forces, to get Baghdad to be a government Sunnis can trust. And the same thing with Tripoli, same thing with, with Damascus. It's, it's these, these governments don't have the trust of their people anymore. Mm. All right, five minutes is yours. Go. Uh, I just wanted to say something about, so I 
this just popped into my head that I didn't think about this beforehand, but I read an article in the New York Times yesterday about uh, investment. And when you're thinking about long-term investing, um, you know, a lot of mutual funds buy and sell depending on how the market works, and they try to, uh, you know, hedge the market. And it doesn't always work, and the best thing that you can actually do is buy smart and then hold on to your investment over time. And I think that that's something the United States doesn't do. We will spend all of this this money and energy and panel discussions like this talking about these things. And then, you know, when it's on the front page of the news, we pay attention to it. And then as soon as it isn't, it's just like it's not there anymore. And I think that's the problem is we're not, we're not, um, we have these little short burst investments. And then we, there's a new shiny spot and, you know, or a big stock that's going up really quickly. And we buy that instead, you know, and, and the, what would be better for us in the long term is to make an investment and stick with it. We enter, then we announce an exit date. And yeah. Nobody trusts us to do the difficult things because they know we're leaving. And investment doesn't mean hanging out and, and you know, occupying territory that people don't want us to be in either, but it's having a presence and maintaining that presence in terms of relationships, not physical control. Yes, ma'am. And now about you, sir. Francis Johnson, Strategic Planning Initiatives. The title, ISIS on the Verge of Defeat or Transforming Itself for the Long Haul. If we could have your comment on both ISIS and Al-Qaeda, where do we stand on these questions? I guess you could say they're invested for the long haul. Like, they're not going to change. They're, they're in it. Go ahead. No, yeah. They're, yeah. As they lose territory, they'll continue to survive. If they morph or if uh, they, they take on an al-Qaeda model, the loss of territory is, is key to, to hurting ISIS. That doesn't mean they go away. And that's the main argument. And if they don't go away, they continue to do things like we saw on the map where those attacks were taking place in Europe and other places. And there'll be other places that, that will be attacked in the future. Yeah, that is similar to what I was saying earlier, where um, right now they're a government, a quasi-government and overt organization, and if that territory is taken away, they'll be forced to be much more covert, and depending on their brand, um, that will really determine if they're able to sustain external operations outside of Syria and Iraq. Then we'll go to you, sir. from uh, inside Iraq. Very, uh, well, almost inconclusive, I would say. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, I was thinking at the, at the beginning, listening, you know, I was wondering if at some point you, one could almost say you're teeing up the next panel, maybe you know, picking up on, the, on your last comment, teeing up the panel for, you know, a year from now, two years from now, meaning we had Al-Qaeda still there, then comes ISIS, you know, we're going to, let's say, get rid of it in Mosul maybe by December, January, who knows. Uh, and in a year's time, there'll be, you know, the 3.0 version. So, and, and I think it, it seems to me that some of it is because we're not doing, you know, the, the correct things. You were talking about, you know, taking out the oxygen. Uh, but then the, the IDPs are, are not going towards the government, what you were saying. They're, you know, they're, they're away from the government. So... We'll take him out militarily in, in, in Mosul, but then how does the how do you reconcile the civilian population? So you know, it's like you take out the tumor, but then you don't do the radiation to get rid of the infection. So the infection is still there, so you're going to have another tumor. So um, six months from now, let's say Mosul operation has occurred, or, you know, succeeded militarily. How would you see the dynamics? Let's say we're sitting here March 13th. Of, uh, of next year. I mean, how, how would you see things happening? Because I think we're not doing, you know, the, the right things in terms of the political uh, dynamics. Thank you. I wrote an article in 2013 about um, leaving power vacuums behind after we conduct these types of operations when we remove these, these terrorist organizations from different areas, whether they're covert or, or overt. In fact, Trump actually cited that in one of his speeches, but <laughs> I digress. Um, I, I completely agree with you, and it, my argument is, was and is uh, we need to come 
back and have some kind of relationship and presence um, similar to what I was talking about earlier where Jabhat al-Nusra filled all of that in Syria when things started to fall apart. Um, they came in and provided services, electricity. We haven't, that has not been a priority for us or really our allies. I mean, did, we didn't do that in Iraq. It was a huge, huge problem. And then there was all these questions about how come the, we're not being embraced by the Iraqi people? Well, they couldn't go to school. They didn't have electricity. They didn't have, you know, access to clean water. I mean, it's not, you know, rocket science necessarily. It's being able to live your daily life. And I think that should be the relationship that we have um, if, if there is some type of defeat later on. I believe the strategy is, is resetting the conditions that led to ISIS to begin with. I think uh, June 2017 will be June 2014 all over again with ISIS 2.0 currently operating the next 18 months in, in this al-Qaeda model where they continue to be able to conduct attacks, continue to build cells. But ISIS 3.0 comes back uh, with an ability to shoot down American aircraft. And that's the one thing that's, that's been key to ISIS holding territory or to losing territories, our ability to take it away with airstrikes and a proxy force, and their inability to shoot down an aircraft. Um, so this strategy, I think, is resetting the conditions, and ISIS doesn't go away. It just simply becomes a stronger version of this iteration, a 2.0 al-Qaeda version in the interim, and then an ability to both take land, keep it, with an added ability to shoot down American aircraft. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, did you have anything? Uh, respectful of everyone's time. Thank you for coming out today. We're two minutes over, but I hope that was an informative panel. And again, uh, Hassan Hassan sends his apologies.